And as we worship you, our worship leads to communion. We respond to your invitation. We respond to your invitation. We remember you. Father, we lift our hands towards you right now. We bless what you're doing right now in people and places. Father, we remember those who gave their life in service to this country. We remember your son who gave in service to, to save us and bring us back to you. We thank you for what you're doing here, Lord. Come and have your way in this place. In your holy and precious name. And the body said, Amen. 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 You did a good job this morning. Thank you, worship team. So, yeah. Give them a great big hand. Uh, we got a couple of announcements for you and you can always, if you're, if you're just catching in or just walking in or, or maybe you're not accustomed to uh, what's happened and what takes place at 970 Church, you can always go to our Facebook page and there you'll find the lovely Mike Hall and his wife Devin, <laughs> right, doing an announcement video pre-service and that, that's, uh, that's just a glimpse of what's going on and taking place at 970 Church. He is turning bright red right now because I told him he was a lovely man. <laughs> if you're new with us, we want to invite you to come connect. And, and if you will, take your phone out um, and you can let everybody know and check in on Facebook. And at the same time, you can scan that QR code and it'll take you to a visitor sheet or a visitor gift guest card and just let you know. You can also do it the old-fashioned way if you want. And there's a uh, communications card there somewhere around you, maybe a seat or a row in front of you or behind you, and you can fill that out and just drop that in the offering here as it goes past in just a few minutes. So uh, we have youth camp. So Student Ministries, your camp application and money is due today. So you should have that, turn that in to Pastor Brittany. Parents, you should turn that into Pastor Brittany and uh, make sure that you've got everything needed. And if you need more time, just let her know and she can make arrangements with you for that. And then we have a, a really special announcement and that is June 8th. That's a Wednesday night. We will not be here for our normal prayer and teaching. Um, we are going to be joining Bethel Assembly. They are hosting revival services. And we, our worship team, is leading worship that night, June 8th. So, and that'll be at 6.30 p.m. So we want to invite everybody to come out. Again, there won't be service here. It'll be over at Bethel Assembly with Pastor Travis and the, the good folks over there at Bethel. And it's, it's a, a time for tribes to come together and to, to worship the Lord and seek his face and, uh, you know, just be in the presence of each other and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Okay. Well, you can do better than that, but I'll give you better. I'll give you a little bit more lead up and build up. Let's receive the Sunday morning tithe and offering, and I need to dismiss student ministries. So if you're at student ministries, <laughs> you know, there's a, while, while they're leaving and you're preparing a communication card or maybe you're giving a check this morning, <laughs> there is a, a pretty big po post on Facebook in the world of social media that says we all need friends that we should not be allowed to sit next to, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, when I think of 970 Church, it's like all of you. Right? And then I think about who I think about who leads you and then I realize it's my fault. So I'm I'm that guy wherever Kate and I go, she has to make sure, she has to tell me on the way in, behave yourself. I need you to behave yourself. Because I it is. It's like and I'm God forbid Jack and Ellie are with me. Because I don't I don't to me, it's no fun to do everything. It's really fun to inspire others to do for you. Amen. Amen. Right? And so when Jack and Ellie are there, um, I'm the chief troublemaker. Not, not by proxy. So, all right. You should have had a good enough time to fill out a communication card by now. <laughs> we'll drop that in the offering as you're going past. If you're a visitor with us, we want to welcome you and thank you that you're here. Let's get ready to give to the Lord. Father, we, as an extension of our worship, we declare you the Lord over our finances as we're faithful with our tithe and offering. It's not about necessarily the size of the gift, but the faithfulness of it and what you do. So we declare you, Lord, the, the Lord over our finances and an extension of our worship this morning we give to you. In your holy and precious name we pray this morning. Amen.
Amen. All right. So I thought about what funny story I should tell you this morning, and it has nothing to do with Sunday morning service. You just need to know that now. Okay? So we were at a church in Springfield, Missouri called Calvary Temple, and we had just pulled off a church merge and we're becoming like this giant five campus, multi campus thing. Well, when we did that, we built so much synergy that everything started to grow. Now, you got to remember, uh, and we're, or maybe you don't know, and I'll, I'll just inform you. Like, we had a building that was built in the 1960s. So, it's about this tall, but it seats about 1,400 people. Okay? And it had wings, and it had a balcony, and it had, you know, it, it had all the stuff. Right? Well, it also had a 1960s boiler unit. And those of you who are familiar with HVAC or boiler units or heating and cooling at all know um, that that is a, a monstrosity unto itself. Okay? So one morning, as we, uh, as we begin to get ready for service, uh, the boiler unit overflow pan has lived up to its name. It has overflowed. And it has overflowed so much because it's trying to, to heat the building up and it's building so much condensation, right, that it has overflowed and we have a new water feature central right here through the lighting system, through the sound system, directly in the middle of the stage. Pastor Steve was there, right? He saw and he walked in and I had my, this is back when you had to wear dress slacks to church or you were, you were not going to heaven, amen? So I had my slacks all the way like rolled up to my knees. They look like shorts, right? And I'm standing in the middle of the room with a wet dry vac sucking up water. Right? And we moved all of service that morning to the gym. And I was so grateful that as the youth pastor, we had a youth sound system. And that we were able to move everything over. And it was fun. Amen. All right. Turn in your Bibles, right, to Ephesians chapter 3. I told you, it had nothing to do with the service. Right? Just when you think it's safe, right? So, I'm not saying we need a water feature. Lord, we don't need a water feature here this morning. But if we get one, you have a staff that already is prepared and been through that and knows what to do. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3. I can tell you more stories, but that's not, uh, we have to have an official meeting. And so I need you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. We're looking at the back, the back side of Ephesians chapter 3. And if you've, if you were here or maybe you have, you haven't been in in a while and you've not been watching and catching up online. Okay. Ephesians chapter 3 is the middle of Paul's letter to the church or to the region in Ephesus. And in chapter 3, we read this. If you've got a good study Bible, it probably says something to the tune of a prayer for the Ephesians right above verse 14. Okay? So it's not just a prayer for the Ephesians. It is, an, it is a prayer that is present for the F church at Ephesus and the region for the churches at Ephesus, but also for today. Right now, believers everywhere. Amen? Okay. He's, this is the second prayer he's going to pray. But he's already prayed once for the readers of the letter and for believers, and that's Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 23. This is the second letter. He prays that they would receive, in his, first, in his first prayer, in the beginning of the letter in chapter 1, he prays that the Ephesus church, that all believers would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation, talking about the Holy Spirit. He prays that the eyes of their heart may be enlightened. And here's why he does it. So that they may know Jesus better, not just by knowledge, but also with experience. Okay? And now we get to Paul's second prayer for, for him, for them, for those believers then and the believers now. He says in verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. I want you to underline or highlight from the word strengthen to inner being. So strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit 
in your inner being. Verse 17 tells us why. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He says, he says this, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, verse 18, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how high, excuse me, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ, right? For the purpose, in, right, or to know this love, excuse me, that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. And he says in this, and this is what we call a doxology. It's, it's a Paul random praise breakout. Right? You kind of, have you ever heard, like we need a praise break? Okay, Paul is the author and the originator of the praise break. So we get to verse 20 and 21. He says, now him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. All right. Let's, let's get into this. Paul's going to pray four specific things for the believers at Ephesus then. Okay. And, and uh, us as believers in the now. Amen. Okay. So what's the first thing he wants them to... Because it kind of... If you think about it like this, it's a four-step... Okay, it's like a four staircase kind of prayer. It kind of steps up every time. Remember, Paul is, is discussing with them his identity and our unity and what our identity is and the purpose behind our identity is to bring unity. Now, I'm going to unpack something real quick and then I'm going to expand on it next week because here's what happens. We tend to be... We tend to have a, a redefinition of unity. Okay. So PC is not politically correct. It means pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, there was a, a definition of unity that meant we can be in the same car and not necessarily have to agree at the same level to, to everything. Now, that was pre-COVID. Like, COVID is the new time dividing line in, on the earth, right? BC is, is not just before Christ, it now means before COVID, right? During the 2016, through the last six years of 2022, we have redefined cult culturally, we redefined unity. And it's not a biblical definition, okay? You go, what do you mean? Well, we, when, when someone says, we're going to unify, dot, 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 what they mean is, what we interpret it to mean, is that we are all going to believe and think the same way. And if we don't, then we're not unified. This is an issue. Now, I'm just going to give you an innocuous example, or as innocuous as I can possibly try to make this. <laughs> there are a lot of ways to do church. The, I mean, if you can think of it, it's a possibility in a way to do church. Our way is not any better than anybody else's way. What I can tell you is this. We can't do church like a 30,000 member church. We can, we, can, we can ascribe to that, right? We can implement some things to that. But that church has its own culture, its own traditions, and its own values. And as long as they're coming from the Bible, we're good. Amen? Okay. There's a thousand ways to do church. Not every way is right, not every way is wrong, but we can still be unified as a body of Christ just because we have a different method of proclaiming the message. You okay? All right, so I'm just going to leave that there because that means I have not stepped into anything, right? You good with that? I'm, <laughs> I really want to step into some things, but I'm not. They don't pay me for my opinion, right? Let's, let's just leave it there. Let's understand there's a lot of ways to do different things. And here's the thing. 
if, if, you think, if you think we can do church better, okay, that's fine. If you want to do it differently, okay, great, let us know. Maybe, you're, maybe you got a different perspective. Maybe, maybe we haven't thought of everything. That's totally fine. Maybe we just flat ran out of volunteers. <laughs> you ever thought of that? We just don't have enough people to do everything we want to do. That's not a volunteer pusher drive. I don't, I'm, just, I'm just letting you know. Like, there's different. If you got 30,000 people, everybody's a greeter. Right? Okay, if you got 30 people, guess what? Everybody's still a greeter. You just didn't know it. Right? <laughs> My point being is this. Not everything we're going to do, we're not going to think the same way. We're not going to process information the same way. If you're a parent, we don't parent the same way. But we can still be in unity and fellowship with one another underneath the Holy Spirit and the church. Correct? Okay. That's not how culture is operating right now. And, and I want to say like this, there are some churches that they're not operating underneath that. Their, their definition of unity is the culture's new definition of unity, and that's not biblical unity. John chapter 17 expresses what biblical unity is. We can be brothers and sisters. We're, and I, I like to say it how Pastor Steve said it, and you just reflect that and say that is what it is. God has welcomed us in, okay, as part of his kingdom and as part of the family. Okay, now let me just finish this tangent, right? Not everybody's definition of family and certainly not culture's definition of family is one we're going to adopt in the family of God. Amen. Hey, come on. L let me, okay, no, that's a pile. I'm, not, I'm going this way. I'm just stay out of it right now. There's a biblical definition of unity. There's a biblical definition of family. And we don't all have to think like one another to be unified. Okay? Nor does that mean if we think differently, that doesn't make us family. It just means we think differently, we process information differently, and we're unified underneath a covenant. I'm going to talk about this a lot next week. In Ephesians chapter 4. We're united underneath a covenant established by the blood of Jesus. Not at a conference. Okay? And not defined by culture. Amen? Alright. So that's the definition of unity. We're going to just get better at that. He prays for them four specific things. One of the reasons why I brought up unity is because the four specific things he's praying for is a reflection of their unity and model as the church. Right? Okay, I didn't explain that one well because like two people nodded their head. Right. If the first part, the first two to three chapters, three chapters of Ephesians is about their identity and it's also about their unity as the church. The second half of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6, it's still about their unity and it's still about their identity, but now it's also about their behavior with one another. Right? Because how many of you know, if you take 30,000 people and put them together, somebody is bound to bump into somebody else and rub somebody the wrong way. Under the cultural definition of unity, the second we disagree, we're out. And then we need to vilify the other party. I, I thought I had missed it, but apparently maybe I didn't. Right? I thought about this just since 1906 in the Azusa Street Revival. How many times has the Protestant or the, the, the charismatic Pentecostal church split? Oh my Lord. I don't, I, I can think of at least three major splits from about 1906 up until about 1996. I mean, split. I mean, divisive division causing people disagreed. Major issues. Right? Not, right what, if, what if we just did it biblically? 
Please, yeah, I, let's do that. All right, four specific things Paul prays for them and for us. Number one, that they and we would be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being. In our inner innards. Right? If you're from the south, you know exactly this is the south translation. That they and we would be strengthened with power through his spirit in our innards. All right, so here's the deal. Pastor Steve preached about half my message this morning. What you and I live in is a physical thing. It's a physical body that has a... (laughs) With all due respect, you get about 120 years tops, according to the Bible, in this thing. And then at some point in time, you got to give it up. Now, how many of you know, like, that's not a bad deal, John? I, I agree, it is not a bad deal. The longer we're here, the more this breaks down. Right? You, you, and I've said this before, we need to understand this. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. Paul is referring to the spiritual man or the, what he calls the inner man. He also says it like that in Romans chapter 7. There is an inner man or there is a spiritual side of us. Okay, that Paul says, I want that strengthened. I don't want the outside phys- strengthened. And he would tell Timothy... Later on, there is some good use of physical training, but I want spiritual training. I want your inner man to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I don't care if your outer man looks like Barney Fife. Right? Yeah. Well, I'll let you think about that on the way home. Maybe I shouldn't have used Barney Fife. How many of you even know who Barney Fife is? Okay, the sad thing is they're still hands down. I'm sorry. Okay, so I don't know, Eric, if you can Google me a picture of Barney Fife. I don't know if we can make that happen. I'll hang around here for a minute or two. Everybody knows what Arnold Schwarzenegger looked like in the 80s, correct? He inspired a lot of people to get into physical fitness. And... Here's what Paul says. It doesn't do you any good if you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but on the inner man and the inside, you look like Barney Fife. What do I mean by Barney Fife? In one episode of Mayberry, Barney had to go on a neck stretcher and wear a padlock to meet a 120-pound weight requirement. Bean pole stick. Right? He's just skinny. Right? And there's nothing wrong with skinny people. Don't raise your hand if you're skinny. By all means, let's leave it down, right? If you can have, if you can eat a whole pizza and not gain but a pound, don't talk. Just nod your head like, yes, pastor, that's, mm mm-hmm, right? There you go. If you're, (laughs) well, that's a good, thank you, Eric. I don't, I don't know what I did to deserve you. (laughs) Right, so since we got this picture up, if you're online, you are missing out this morning, I'm telling you. That's a good picture of what a lot of our Christian inner man looks like. Scared and, and skinny. <laughs> right? <laughs> with a bullet in your pocket. You're not even walking around with a loaded Bible. <laughs> You're like, what are you talking about? Okay, one thing about Barney Fife you need to know is that he would accidentally, randomly discharge his revolver. Just by putting his hand on it. And they kept blaming it on a hair trigger. So Sheriff Andy Taylor made him pull out all the bullets of his gun and carry one bullet in his pocket. There's a lot of believers, this is what we look like. Scared, skinny, and we're not even walking around with a loaded Bible. In other words, we really don't know how to operate in this thing. And then the second something goes bump in the night, Or we get scared or, God forbid, a demon-possessed person shows up on Sunday morning, right? We're like, oh, no, ushers, take him out of here. Well, pastor, you did that. No, he was drunk and he was not interested in deliverance at all. (laughs) That was a couple months ago. Now, would I go back and change it? Sure, why not? You go, what do you mean? Well, why not? Look, if you're thinking we're perfect, I need you to take a hard, long look in the mirror. We're not, we're, we are far from perfect. And the church is meant to be in a place of equipping, right? And what if someone shows up and they're not possessed and we actually try to cast the demon out? You go, well, you failed. Are they going to come back? I don't know, but at least we tried. How many times have we prayed for healing, right? And you go, I didn't get healed. 
at least we tried. You're like, well, that's not a very nice prize. You're right, it's not a very nice prize. That's why we keep trying. Amen? What if I give somebody a word and the word is like totally off? At least you tried. And trying is a precept for training. Come on. All right, let's get back to the word for just a second. We're spiritual beings. We're having a physical experience. And a lot of times we look like Arnold Schwarzenegger and on the inside we look like Barney Fife. We're scared. We're, we're spiritually malnourished. And when the enemy shows up, it's not a contest because we tucked our tails and ran. And this is Paul, what, what, he's, what he is praying for them and for us is this, that you would be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit on the inside, in the inner man and the inner being. You go, how do I train the inner man and the inner being to get to, to look less like Barney Fife and more like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Reading word, spending time in presence. And listen to me, I am not coming to you as though I have attained anything. I'm right there alongside you, right? I've got to wake up. I've got to have time with God. Period. Right? Because that's how we stay out of the stuff. More importantly, it's, it's not just that we stay out of the stuff. It's also how we grow in our relationship with Him. And we, we go from untrained skinny and scared to fully trained and operating in the power that he paid for. Right? Now here's the other thing. How many of you would only eat one time a week? Do I see no hands up right now. Okay, good. That is not at least you would only eat one time a week. Right? You'd be like, no, that's a horrible nutrition plan. You're absolutely right. Right? You might do it. You, I'm not talking about times of prayer and fasting. I'm talking about your nutrition plan is I only eat one time a week. Right? Okay. So if you wouldn't physically do that to yourself, then why do we think it's okay to do it to ourselves spiritually? Right? If the only context of my relationship with God that gets fed is, on a, is maybe on a midweek service for an hour... And maybe two hours on a Sunday morning. That's why I look like Barney Fife. Come on. If we wouldn't do that physically, why would we do it spiritually? Right? We need to be strengthened. And here's the thing. In order to be strengthened in the inner parts, our inner parts or our innards got to go spend time with the Holy Spirit. We got to go spend time in prayer. We got to go spend time in worship. And I don't mean just the 15 minutes we justify to ourselves in the car listening to K-Love. I don't have any problems with K-Love. Man, if that's all you got, do it. But we need more than that, correct? And we need a consistent basis. I, I love it when people sign up and they want to do personal training and they want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but they only go to the gym like for 45 minutes a week. If it were that easy... Oh my gosh, I would sell that in a pill and write a book about it. <laughs> Come on. It takes consistency and it takes, it takes showing up. Here's the thing. For most of us, it just takes the scheduling of the time and, and then fulfilling it. All right, enough of that. He says, verse 17, it's for this purpose. So that Christ may dwell in, may dwell in our hearts through faith. This is where we get that concept. You've got to ask Jesus into your heart. Because he comes and he lives there by faith. Maturity says Jesus lives at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding. Okay? What's Paul's point? The, his point is very simple. Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that's how our innards are going to be strengthened for him. The Holy Spirit. Okay? Holy Spirit partnered with faith. Right? Christ may dwell in my heart. In other words... Let me, let me put it in layman's terms for us, okay? This thing right here, right? Not, not the knowledge, not just head knowledge, like heart revelation knowledge leads to life transformation is Jesus sitting on the throne of this thing right here, amen? Okay, because if Jesus is sitting on the throne of this thing right here, right? We don't look like Barney Fife anymore. 
Or at least if we look like Barney Fife, on the inside looks like Jesus himself, because Jesus is much stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> What's funny about the physical characteristics of Paul is Paul was a bald, short Barney Fife, physically. He was a scholars place him underneath six feet, bald, and needed glasses. He had bad eyesight. But if you ran up on Paul with a spiritual issue, oh boy, you were in trouble. Right? He was not afraid to cast the demon out and keep walking. And didn't even turn around and deliver and minister deliverance, or he just gone, that's done, you good, okay, bye. And just kept going. He didn't even plug you into the local church. <laughs> he just, yeah, that's, we're done. Goodbye. All right. Number two, what Paul prayed for us and them was that they would, first of all, be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being for the purpose that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Number two, that they and we may have power to grasp the depth of God's love. Okay. This is really important for us to understand. God loves you like a son and like a daughter. Okay, and we, we have a good, I think, head understanding of that. What Paul is praying is for a, a heart revelation of what it means to be loved unconditionally by God. Because part of what, what, a, what uh, the part of this, and I've shared this before, the part of this that surpasses all knowledge is Jesus is so convinced, God is so convinced that if you have a revelation of his unconditional love for you, it'll transform your life from the inside out, right? Paul specifically would, would refer to it in Ephesians like this. He would say in verse 18, you may have power together with all the saints to grasp. He says, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. To grasp how wide, and, and he would, scholars put it in a, in, a, in a vernacular that we could understand. He said, wide enough to cover the breadth of our experiences, long enough to continue the length of our lives and beyond. It rises to the heights of our celebration and it reaches to the depths of our discouragement and our despair. In other words, God's love is total and God's love is actually inescapable. In Romans chapter 8, Paul would express it to the church at Rome like this. He says, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation watch will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord right it's it's total and it's inescapable can you walk away from it yes is it still following you yes can you reject it yes did you change did he change his mind about you no This is what the biblical definition of love is. What the world's definition of love is, is if you agree with me, then at least we have the foundation of me loving you. But if you disagree with me, I don't want, no, I no longer not love you. I don't want anything to do with you. Right? This is where culture's at right now. Now, here's the scary part. This is what culture is teaching the two, three generations right now in college, in high school, in junior high, and in elementary school. So four. Four generations right now are understanding this cultural definition of unity, which we talked about, and now this culture's understanding of love. Right? And, and you've got to understand, when you have an encounter with the unconditional love of God, normally that just tends to wreck the rest of your day. <laughs> now... Can you walk away from it? Sure. Can you reject it? Sure. But it, he didn't... Just because we behave that way does not change his behavior about us. Still love you. The father still loves Judas. Judas. 
Jesus still gave his life for the betrayer. Right? That's unconditional love. Oh, man, that hurts, doesn't it? And we, we get upset if someone has like a differing opinion on social media. Whoa. Don't, hey, I've unfriended many, okay? Some of you, I'm like, oh, I thought we were friends. Okay, never mind. <laughs> have you, on a total side note, have you ever gotten a friend request with someone who you thought we were friends? And you're like, oh, what did I, what? And the, yeah, you just, those of you without social media, bless you. It's impossible to be separated from the love that's visible through Jesus. One of the things that um, just, I mean, we're going to get to this point here in just a second, but it's a love that surpasses understanding. Let's get to number three first. Paul prays that they, we would know this love that surpasses. Oh, that is number three. There you go. You should read your notes, stupid. We should, we would know his love that surpasses. I thought it made sense. I was making a point. Uh, anyway, number three is that they would know this love that surpasses all knowledge. Right? It's a total love. It's an unescapable love. And yet we're called to know its depths and breadths and know that it will go beyond our understanding. How many of you need a love and can, let me just let, say, it, say it like this. A lot of times we're trying to understand an unconditional, un, excuse me, an unconditional, unfathomable love. And if our logic dictates to us, I have to understand it in order for me to accept it, this is where we get hung up. Because God's love, we sang the song this morning, it is reckless. In the sense of what? It doesn't make any sense. Luke chapter 15, Jesus shares the parable of where reckless love, the song, comes from. It is reckless to leave the 99 sheep and go find the one. That is, you, you're like, are you calling God reckless? In the way that he loves us, it's, it, like that's not a characteristic I've ever heard talked about. But think about it for a second. Would you leave 99 to go find the one? You're like, nope. I got 99. I'll make more. And yet Jesus goes, nope. I need that one. I'm going to go find him. That's, that's a love that surpasses knowledge and understanding. When we sin and when we mess up, cultures, culture, needs more than and I'm sorry an, an ownership and they need restitution and that person needs to be punished and they need to this and that and yet we find in scripture that while Jesus does not always remove the natural consequences of our decisions he doesn't make it hard to come back to him and be forgiven. The Bible says in, I believe it's 1 John 1, 9 and 10, if, he is, if, if we will, for, if, yeah, that one. Eric, help me. If we confess, there we go, thank you. If we confess our sins, there you go. You should know where it is anyway. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Does that sound like it's a hard thing? If I'll just confess, Lord, I have made a mistake and I need your forgiveness in this area of my life or in that area of my life. God doesn't always remove the natural consequences of our decision, but he doesn't make it impossible for us to come back to him. Peter denied Jesus not once, because Judas did it once. Peter did it three times, and publicly. And if we're looking at cultural, culture's standard and definition of that, 
Well, you're out. You can't serve me. You can't be my disciple. Peter, I love you. But I'm, I'm going to change your mission and your destiny now because I can't, I can't use you to build the church. Oh. You go, wait, that's in Scripture? No, it's not. What you see is Jesus cooking Peter breakfast, which this is my personal opinion. You don't have to agree, but we can still all be unity. Right? Fellowship with meal is a good way to start reconciliation. Or just a meal in the name of fellowship. And maybe you don't need to be reconciled. Maybe you just need to go have dinner. Right? Jesus serves Peter breakfast. And then he says this, Peter, do you love me? And Peter goes, yeah, you know I love you. He goes, okay, feed my sheep. In other words, in the reconciliation, in the forgiveness, the Lord never removed Peter's destiny. Come on. And he restored him. And we leave the church over somebody taking my seat. Or the chairs are purple. No, I don't know any church with purple chairs. Or they wove in the gray and the purple chairs. Come on. It seems silly, doesn't it? it does we, I, I've been in ministry way too long. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not, don't pray for me. I'm not jaded. I'm just saying. We get hung up over some dumb things. We, we get twisted up around things that are not what I would call salvific. In other words, it does not have to do with our salvation and our relationship with Jesus Christ. And a lot of times... The foundation of that stuff is our own pride and our own humanness and our own flesh. Number four. That they, that we would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Holy cow. Let me read this to you again. Verse, let's start in in verse 17, he says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, he says, being rooted and established in love, verse 18, this was number three, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of God. And I pray to, that you would know this love, that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Me that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. I looked, I spent probably more time on this point than any other point, and here's why. It's not, there's not a biblical scholar that can agree. <laughs> in other words, they're not necessarily unified into what this specific means, right? If you're, if you're, if you're coming from more of a Baptist, non-Holy Spirit upbringing, that scholar and that, that commentary has a different opinion than a, than a, than a spirit-filled, Pentecostal, charismatic scholar and commentary might have. And that's okay. They're not, I don't think necessarily that they're wrong. I think you can have your cake and eat it too. Most of the time. Measure of the fullness of God. Without the Holy Spirit, it is really hard to be full of anything. Uh, that's a joke. I'll let you get it on the way home. Paul would say it to the church at Colossians in chapter 2, 9 and 10 like this. He says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, lives in bodily form. And in Christ, watch, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Understand something. If we're in Christ, we've already been brought to fullness. Okay? Okay? 
It's union with Christ and through the empowering Holy Spirit that we're complete. Without indwelling, infilling of Holy Spirit, what I'm saying is this. We're not necessarily the most complete and the most full we could be. Amen? 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 says this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil. What is Peter saying? You've been given the fullness of Christ and everything you need to defeat the flesh. Where does it come from? From the fullness in Christ. Here, here's where we go. We, we were talking about this a little bit as we're setting some things up for breaking darkness on Wednesday nights. A lot of times we settle for what's fake. What do I mean by that? We settle for fake stuff and, and here's why. It's not because we haven't discerned what the real thing is. It's just because we're not hungry enough for the real thing. One, one of the things about fasting, and I don't teach about fasting very much, this, there's, everybody's got a book about fasting. Here's one of the things that happens when we fast. There's a spiritual hunger that begins to overtake. Right? So when we are fasting and praying, we are actually creating a hunger internally or in the inner man that longs for more of what the Spirit has to offer. And, and it's ironic because if we'll focus on the inner man during a fast the outer man begins to come into alignment with what the Spirit is doing in us. Does that make sense? In other words, we start casting off some of the things because the inner man now is getting fed and overriding what the, what the flesh needs or wants. You right? Are you okay? Right? So here's what the purpose of a fast is for every believer for all time. And you don't need me to call the church to a fast. You can do one wherever you're at with whatever you've got and however the Lord is leading you. It's to create a spiritual hunger instead of just fixing the external craving of a, of a fleshly hunger. Does that make sense? Okay? So we create... We create a hunger for the spiritual things of the Lord. When we start fasting, which is, that's one of the things that needs to happen. We become full of what the Holy Spirit now wants to do with us. Jesus would often find himself, after having ministered, praying and fasting, getting alone with the Lord so that he could be recharged. Right? Now, that's just like little things. Okay? When we go into like a 40-day fast, that's a whole different topic for a whole nother time. So I just want you to see the difference there. God wants to be the source of our fullness. In John chapter 10, verse 10, in the NIV, it reads like this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and life to the full. Come on. God wants to be the source of our fullness. That means don't get satisfied by the stuff that's fake. Be it authenticity or likes. Let me pick on social media for a second. It's, it's not an authentic friendship. You can be friends with people on Facebook or social media, wherever you're at, and never have any more than that interaction. Uh-huh. Is that a relationship? Well, to an extent. But are you seeing and are you getting to know whoever that may be in the fullness of who they are? Not at all. As a matter of fact, you could be anybody you want to on social media. That's the scary thing. Matthew chapter 6 verse 32 and verse 33. For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows what you need, that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteous and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, what? Seek the fullness of the kingdom. Seek the fullness of his righteousness. 
Right, I wonder if we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit once, have we ever been baptized again? Have we had, have we had the one encounter and gotten the one t-shirt and the, and the one coffee mug and never realized it wasn't just for a one-time thing, it was for me to stay full of the Holy Spirit. It was to stay full of his presence. It was to stay full of him. It brings God joy to fill his children with all that we need. I want to close with Ephesians chapter 3, 20 and 21. He says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. I I want us to understand something. There are no limits to what God can do. There, there are no limits to what God can do. And I would say it like this. There are no limits to what God can do within you. There are no limits to what God can do through you. The limits only exist in our mindset, in a belief, in a lens that says, I've never seen that done before. And God goes, does that mean it can't be done? There was a long time in the church before the Lord started raising people from the dead and interrupting funerals that there wasn't there was no way to be resurrected from the dead and then Jesus started inviting himself and interrupting funerals and for the first time in about 450 years not since the days of Elijah and Elisha did you have somebody walk up on the scene and command a little girl to get up and they're going what a minute or I love the one in Luke the widow's son has died and Jesus not even invited like at least Jairus invited Jesus to come Jesus wasn't even invited to that funeral and you just kind of get the picture or this is how I pictured it was that he just walked up got up from the picnic table of having lunch with the disciples and went hold on I'll be right back and just walked over there and raised the widow's son up didn't ask permission, wasn't invited, just went and did. I'm not telling you to go do that. That's not. <laughs> Yet for a while, God didn't do that. Until he did. I love it. God can't save this person. Until he does. God can't heal that person. Until he does. There are no limits with the Lord. There are none. He works in his infinite ability beyond our prayers and our thoughts, imaginations by his power and at work within us. And Paul closes the chapter three with this. To him be the glory. I think that's a great way to close today. I'm not going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. I think we're mature enough and familial enough with each other to know, you know what? There's some people in the room You're going through it. And instead of doing this at the end of worship, as we have been, I think it's appropriate to end our service with, we're going to give God the glory. We're going to give him the praise. And we're going to have a corporate prayer. And I'm going to bless you. And I I want to do this. You're here this morning and you need prayer. Would you just simply raise your hand right now? You're just going through it. It doesn't, I don't know what it is. and, And I don't have to know what it is. I know he knows what it is. And he knows exactly what you need. Maybe you just need peace. Maybe you need rest. Maybe you need an answer to a prayer. Lift your hand. Come on. Don't be nice. There's one. There's two. There's three. All right. Now, body of Christ, go. There's one in the back. Look for a hand. Raise your hand. Raise raise your hand. Now, go pray with someone who's got their hand raised. In Jesus' name, go. Take a prayer partner if you need to. Father, in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, right now, we give you the glory. Father, we give you the honor. We give you the praise for what you have done and, what for, you've, and for what you're continuing to do. Lord, if it's a physical need and a healing right now, I pray that in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, that need would be met. That pain would be gone. That inflammation, we command it to go right now in the name of Jesus. 
If it's bones, if it's muscle, we command them to come together. We command them to be loosed. If it's a nerve, we command that thing to come down in the name of Jesus. Lord, if it's distraught, depression, disruption of whatever is happening, and fracture to the mind, whatever it is, Lord, we pray for peace by his presence in the name of Jesus. Lord, I know that there are some who are just needing comfort, and we, we draw upon the truth of your word that you are close to the brokenhearted. Lord, I pray that 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 peace would be present so much in their life that they would be strengthened. Lord, for those who need a financial miracle, you're the provider. And we obediently place that trust and that faith in you. Lord, for those who are facing a big decision, it says in James, let us ask for wisdom. I pray that you would give wisdom right now in the name of Jesus. Supernatural insight and understanding into the problem and into what's happening and that you would solve that, Lord, outside the box, outside of what we can possibly think, dream, or imagine. Lord, right now as we get, as we get ready to close the service, We recognize that we are praying with folks and we want to continue that ministry. But I want to bless you. We bless those right now, Lord, who are hurting. I pray that you would, um, Lord, that there would be an experience, an encounter with your love that that would plant a seed that would forever transform and change life right now. I pray, Father, that you would bring the low places up and bring the high places low. That you would come alongside, come behind, go in front of, make it a smooth and stable path that we walk with you according to your word. I pray that your favor would rest upon your people. There, There would be divine encounters in the name of Jesus this week as we recognize ourselves as followers of Christ sent out doing the work of the kingdom. We bless right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for what you're doing, God. In your name we pray, amen. If you're being prayed for and you still got some things going on, man, just stay there, Let be prayed for, you're good. He weeps with those who weep and mourns with those who mourn. We bless you. Hey, we do have Wednesday night prayer and teaching, so come this this coming Wednesday. And then June 8th, we're going to be at Bethel. Don't want to miss that. It's going to be awesome. Time of revival and refreshing. We love you guys. We'll see you then.